Hi, welcome to the Untitled Interview Series. This is episode two. Um, today I will have with me Justin Harris, who is a friend of the After Show. Um, he's an artist and a creator and a community builder um, and an innovator and just all kinds of wild things. He is um, uh, somebody who I admire greatly and I, I watch work on such a consistent and seemingly tireless basis um, that it, it surprises me. He is a, he's a powerhouse of a, of a mind. Um, when I say into innovator, I really mean it. Um, so today we'll be talking about community building and um, some of the work that he's been doing. Um, and mostly I'm just going to listen to him uh, tell me things. Um, I'm really glad to be able to share this conversation with him. It's not the first we've had. Um, he was our, our second resident artist um, way back when, I think in June. Uh, and we also did a public conversation with him, I think a live stream. Um, I will link in this video. Uh, probably also back in June, we talked a lot about sort of post-capital currency um community as currency as 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 means for artists and things like that and i think we'll probably talk a bit more about that today um i guess i'll say before we start that i i really enjoy doing um once i do the third or fourth or fifth take of these uncut intros uh i really like um talking to you before i talk to the artist because i don't know what i'm going to go into um that's how it goes with a with a live conversation and and you may have noticed from the last one that I did with Alyssa that I don't cut these so um it's just it's a it's a fun thing in a time like now um when we can't have in-person conversations with friends late at night over a wine or after dinner or something and just you know meander our thoughts and talk about all kinds of things. Um, we can't do that in person, but uh, we can do it here, and I can bring you along. So um, glad to get to do that with you. Let's uh, let's get into our chat with Justin. See you in a second. Cool. All right, I have Justin Harris with me here today, with two pairs of glasses. One is for recording snaps. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh no way! Really? Is that true? Yeah, these are the the Bose AR. Whoa! Glasses, headphones. That's so cool. It's nice. Yeah, those days where you like forget your headphones or your uh, or your earpod, or and, you know you don't have any these stuff come in handy because you know I don't walk outside the house without my glasses. So. Wow. That's awesome. It's much safer. Yeah. yeah, that is a much safer life. That's super cool. Um, well, we uh, we had a little bit of a false start. Um, I could probably just not include saying this, but <laughs> it feels more uh, more opening up of the environment that I I hit record and we started talking and then I realized I wasn't recording. So um, there's some moments of genuine human interaction you'll never be able to get to see, but it's fine because <laughs> it set the mood. <laughs> So I'm here with Justin. Um, I've already given you, my watcher, a a little bit of a preamble about who Justin is. Um, Justin, how would you describe yourself? I would love to. I always love to hear every different time you describe yourself because I think that you have a lot to say about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm Justin. I'm a creative professional, uh, futuristic abstract art. I love visualizing and designing and predicting the future. Um, I design websites, uh, produce videos. I'm a jack of all trades, do a lot. Um, and as a visual artist, um, it's very fun to take abstract things and apply meaning to them. And um, yeah, it's a, a little bit of, about me. Yeah, yeah. Um... That that's like oh that's a conversation in and of itself but like the building the building a, a language you know within an abstract like palette that's a pretty powerful thing and I guess designers do that a lot 
Um, you know, all artists do that, but to me, it feels like you you kind of bridge a lot of that, right? Like you do a lot of like directly abstract art, but there is like there are a lot of design elements in your art. Yeah, and um, I, I feel like everyone gets to interpret it in their own sense. Yeah. Way which makes it kind of special because there's like been billions of possibilities of what it means rather than one. Um, but then when you look at those design elements, yeah, it really gives me and really anyone permission to create and to publish and to not worry about like not being an artist or not being. Uh, so I find it really fun to just you know, create. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, so maybe we'll. I kind of didn't have an order for this, as yeah. as I'm expecting is going to be the thing. I can hear myself on delay a little bit, but it's fine. Um, uh, at the top, let's talk about let's talk about your website. Um, that way, anybody that chimes in can see right off the bat what we're talking about, and then we can go from there. I would really love because there's some things I don't know still. I would love to know. Oops, how how it's gone? You just launched. Within the last month, is that true? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I um, will start off. I'm really excited about my brand new site, um, justin.chat, HTTP colon slash slash justin.chat, um, which is kind of like a brand new. I literally just brought it live like yesterday. Oh, cool. It syncs within the whole like visionary past and uh, in every realm or, or a realm of what I would call all things visionary mm-hmm. and um, yeah I I sense that like I have a lot of Facebook friends I have a lot of LinkedIn connections I have a lot of friends on Twitter COVID's made it really hard to connect in real life um, I also have a lot of people that are just like not any social media mm. so I was like why not just create a direct way people can communicate with me and create my own social media? Yeah, cool. <laughs> create uh, my own app in a sense to where I can directly communicate with my fans and my patrons and my supporters. Um, because every week I was making like a new website or a new project, <laughs> yeah. a new thing, and I'm like, I'm just going to throw everything on this one website now. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, that's that's um, Justin in that chat, and I feel like that we can break up into uh, hundreds of topics depending on what we want to prioritize. But um, yeah, the most relevant would be of course the visionary path. Right. Yeah. So I guess I would say talk to me about visionary path, like I don't know what it is. A yeah, little bit. So visionary path is an interactive piece of art. This is my visionary path, and um, you can open up any link with a contactless tab. So it uses the same technology as like Apple Pay or Google uh, Wallet, and you just tap it, and like magic, it pulls up um, whatever link that's on the visionary path on your phone. Mm-hmm. And um, I've also put it in various different forms. Canvas art, like right there on the wall. Yeah, right, um, right. And... Yeah, I'm taking like a lot of that abstract digital content that I've created and then applying it to a physical realm that can mean absolutely anything and then bringing in deeper interactive and dynamic meanings of that with technology because you can go up to it and actually touch the art, which I think is pretty special because most exhibits are like, don't touch me or don't sure. interact with me. Right, right. But through augmented reality and physical digital connections, you get to understand like, the, the artist's the vision and statement on a deeper level. So um, I'm really taking like technology, like this, this contactless stuff has been around for over a decade, right? And really uh, applying it to a visual artist's like use case, uh, and that's visionary class. There, there really are so many different like directions that we could go in that because the first one that, that piques my interest, apart from anything that I jotted down to want to ask you or talk to you about, is like as somebody who who studied visual art in college a lot of artists are always thinking i studied sculpture and a lot of artists are always thinking of the longevity of a piece um 
including curators or like museum workers which is why like you can't touch the art because if you touch it it's gonna something's gonna start to happen right um and i think that i guess putting words in your mouth or, or maybe this is my question asked with a period instead of a question mark is like to me it almost feels like the interaction in the community building at the the the, the interaction um is such a crucial piece to that art that it wouldn't make sense to think about like to even think about oh if somebody touches that art it might have you know a shorter half-life like doesn't matter that doesn't of course of course that's the case <laughs> that's how yeah. that's how we exist like so you you bring a life you bring a, a livelihood to the piece of art by by acknowledging it that's sort of like i mean that's a different conversation that's like circular economy stuff right like sustainable culture like acknowledgement that like yeah might not live forever but that's because you used it <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah it's it's kind of like um uh, when you look at like what tesla did to their cars like, like their cars get better over time and it's like the one car that you can buy and it like gets better like every other car definitely depreciates right sure. tesla's probably depreciate too but they depreciate with a greater value. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So maybe, like, the art, I don't know, I guess art, art doesn't really depreciate depending on how. Uh, look at it, but yeah. Um, it, you kind of want to look at maybe even touching it sooner because who knows what may happen on the other side of that unknown digital connection. It's like, right. it could change at any time too. So it's like, it's very, uh, What's what's the word for it? It's very, I guess there's an incentive that to, uh, to touch beyond it, just even you know, yeah, lasting longer because it like what's on the other side could could last for an hour, it could last for twelve hours, it could last forever. <laughs> right, true, true. That's interesting. Now with with Visionary Pass, I guess another thing that I've thought about is that you are sort of it almost feels like portrait work because you get commissioned right? Some of this work is commissioned work where you're then making one for somebody, in which case you're building a portrait of them in some sense, right? You're creating a language. Yeah, that's the best part of um, like being able to understand and learn about this person. It feels like you create that personal connection with them. Hmm. And I think it's what makes visionary pass unique or the painted model when you have visionary pass painted and you get it they don't know what it looks like until they either log into the app or until they unbox it that's cool um, yeah and just me being able to create something based off what i know about them or what they tell me about them um really sets it up for a great surprise and a great feeling um, it's hard to to even describe or even explain it's it's just something that, yeah experience <laughs> that's super cool what um do you have any examples of like ways that people are interfacing with this that maybe exceeded your expectations yes um i am really amazed at uh, how personally attached people have become like i i thought that like for me my past Often when I'm at home, uh, it's, you know, either on, on my table, on my desk, um, and then when I'm out, I'm typically wearing it. Um, and I'm just shocked at how many people, uh, they'll take their pass, and it's like in every photo that they upload to Instagram. Mm. Um, or it's in, uh, you know, the ability to take something and then someone else love it more than, like, me has, has been really impressive. Uh, um, and I didn't expect that because I didn't realize how deep that personal connection would be. Even be. Like, it's not something you can even buy anywhere else. Like, you can't buy a personal connection with someone. Yeah, right. It's, it's, I mean, like, technically you do. You add value by, you know, paying for that commission. But uh, it's stronger than just the exchange of, you know. So I was really shocked to see that, like, it's really allowed me to establish 
like stronger bonds and connections over someone taking a piece of art that I create and then really like falling in love with them. Um, yeah, that's super cool. I, I think like a too long don't read if I was to summarize that. I've got hundreds of prototypes that I like sketched out for this and that just sit in a drawer and I honestly expected all the other visionary passes to be like that. Like, oh, I'm going to sit this out. Someone will sit this in a drawer. Right. And they'll see it like, every time they clean up a drawer <laughs> but but instead people have been like posting it and wearing it and putting it in places and like that that exceeded my expectation because like i only look at my uh badges you know every once in a while mm-hmm. like, they literally they're in my closet and whenever i go out my closet and i pull out you know my drawer i see them it's definitely exceeded my expectations on people you know Hanging the art and sharing the art. Yeah. Rather than throwing the drawer. <laughs> yeah, that's a beautiful thing. And that is such a cool thing. I I I guess that that, that really that does that naturally is. um lead me to what I originally had wanted to talk about, which was with with this endeavor that I wasn't aware of until just now, which is the Justin dot chat. Before that, you had incorporated, I think, into Visionary Pass some semblance of community within the passes. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly Justin there. Right, cool. Cool. So, so, like, you thinking, I can see you thinking, just as I do, a lot about community building and incorporating that into this technology and this art. And and I guess I want to know from you... Um, obviously I know some of what you're thinking and maybe anybody watching does too because you're having this conversation with me which is a conversation about art and community building from afar in a time of COVID right but like yeah. I guess I just I, I want to think I want to ask you what you think about community building in, in, in COVID communi- community building right now I mean, literally right now, (laughs) Um, you know, it's uh, for us, it's the night before the election. Um, And to make, you know, to make a a big uh, tailspin from talking about that to talking about this. But like, that's all I've been thinking about the last couple of days. It's all I ever think about is community building anymore. But but it's all I've really been thinking about and how we're it's going to be our job to really take any ounce that we've not been putting towards community building and to lean that much further into this um, over the next bunch of months, bunch of years, you know? And I guess I wonder how how that ties into into Visionary Pass and, and, and your whole um, sort of gestalt of, of art making, because I think you're definitely a, yeah. a gestalt artist, you know? Definitely being able to put community first in, in everything, including art. Like, right. Like, it's crucial in a COVID normal world. Right. And, like, our current situation in post-COVID, when we get a cure or figure out how to survive. Yeah. And the way I look at the community, it resonates with, like, your values. Everyone has a unique set of values or ways they like to do things. And when you find other people that like to do things similar to you or even different that you can learn from and grow with and make positive changes with, form community. Hmm. And I think that's pretty special. And to be able to do that on the internet. Yeah. Twenty twenty or you know, we've been able to do it for a while now, but with the continuous advancements of technology in almost real time, it's pretty special. Uh, I I think if COVID would have happened five years ago, it would have been pretty scary. Like, yeah, would have not really been a thing. Um, live streaming was not as easy as pressing a button. It actually set up you know servers and things. And uh, so when I think about how advanced technology has come, it's really helped out with the community. And you add in those two things together, uh, and anyone can start a community based off anything that they want to do in in today's world. And the best startups and the 
best companies and the best sort of local ventures, they all start with a community. Right. So if, you're, if you want to be an activist, if you want to be an artist, if you're a founder, it's better to build a community. It's better to, you know, even if it's just like five of your family members, <laughs> um, sure. it's better to build a, your base of community members uh, and then implement your vision for what you want to do in life into that. Because um, the best things in life are communities and, and lifestyles, and I strongly believe. Say that last sentence again. I'm sorry, you cut out. The best things in life are communities and lifestyles, and I strongly believe that. Yeah. And, and I directly correlated all things visionary into that model of, of community building and content. Um, so yeah. yeah, I agree. I agree with that. I think that's that's a really powerful message um, to remind to remind anybody that to remind people that they anybody can can build community and and are are asked to on a on a basis more frequently than they realize. I think right, like it's not a huge hurdle to build community. We build we do that every single day. Um, we just do it in sort of like quanta that we don't recognize, if that makes sense. <laughs> but all of the tools are at our disposal to make these communities. And like you say now, like to utilize the internet as a tool and then take that one step further to use your art as a tool for building community. It's all there. It's all available to you. Um, you just have to implement it. And it starts on small scale. Um I, I think one thing, because again, again, a million times I have different directions I want to take this, ask different questions I want to ask you. Um, the one thing I was thinking about is like, I guess like community as a shield, right? In in moments like this, it's community is, is sort of the, the fountain of youth. <laughs> it's, it's the, it's the, the anchor um, in moments like this. It's the currency uh, in fact, I, I I believe that the last time we talked in June, um, we did a public. We did you were our resident artist one year or one month, um, but then we also did a public chat. You mean Brandon? And I think that I think we talked a lot about community, basically as currency, um, which may, makes sense. I don't remember precisely, but make makes sense that we might have talked about that. Um, and and I think that I think that right now I'm I'm thinking a lot about community as as a shield community as a protector um during today and tomorrow and you know literally the foreseeable week you know um and i'm wondering what you think about that and how you how you interact with with that kind of that kind of thinking yeah i like the uh the shield comparison because that community ends up feeling your passion and your creativity and your ability to be happy and to create consistently yeah and it's much easier when you have people that you can be vulnerable and open with and communicate on how you feel on to what you're doing and where you need support and communities give you that right uh, if you're building with without a community then those things are missing and you don't have a shield and uh, it may be ten times harder to you know, move from point A to point B when you don't have community as a shield to just you know, be open. Um, so I think it's definitely really important uh, for for people to have that type of shield, that type of support network, uh, and yeah, using it as currency and and fuel. I'm sure we can come up with a million different analogies for how that would work. Right. Uh, but 100% supporter of, of being able to, you know, have that community that keeps you moving forward. Yeah, and you, you use the you use the magic word for me, which is vulnerability. I think anybody that that knows me even vaguely anymore <laughs> knows that that's like yeah. that's it. That's all I that's all I try to lean into. You know, um, I've been thinking a lot about. Feeling, I think that phrase for me has has been um, that in this time, I think we've all been radicalized, right? We've all been almost 
striated yes. just turned into our most basic pro- like primal form or something like that and and mm-hmm. and mine has really been just like just like radical vulnerability <laughs> you know um but i think that 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 goes hand in hand with with community you can't have community building without things like that um and i i i jotted this down cuz it, it it's something i do think about a lot in terms of you as an artist performance artist person person who holds the flame of humanity any of these descriptors you know they're like even even down to the way that you interact online uh, even and especially right now uh leading community through experience and through your vulnerability right like like sharing stories you, you know you share stories on on instagram and elsewhere i think but those are the ones that i see um and that's like that's an inspiring thing that's a powerful thing because you're sharing yourself every single day and as a result you like you're whole you're held accountable by your community your there's all kinds of things that that becomes a tool for um and i th- i think i know that to be a a deliberate choice on your part but i i would like i guess i'd like to hear how you interact with that feelings yeah. on I, I like, uh, I guess in the twi- Twitterverse, we call this as part of building the public. Um, oh, interesting, yeah. It, it really uh, became popular, um, but it's just really hard to do going back to, I'm going to link, you know, your shield that we just talked about all the way to, like, how do we build in public? Hmm. How do we be vulnerable and share? Because Instagram makes it simple, looks sexy. Yeah, right. <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> yeah. All the time at least. Um, it's very hard. It's very tough. Especially when things go wrong or things are not going well. And to be able to communicate that, um, sometimes story does, stories does the job, sometimes it does. But I made, I think in August, when I started building the app for Visionary Pass, I made a decision to just say, I'm going to do all of this in the public light, talk about, you know, the cons and the pros. So since then I've been tweeting and I've been publishing to my story Mm -hmm. uh, consistently day after day. And it's been quite a a challenge. You know, I can go back and just look at this Twitter list of like everything that went well and everything that didn't, which has been really nice. And um, it's also inspired others to one, get done because they see me doing work. And then it's inspired me to continually get work done because people are encouraging me along the way. So building in public kind of creates that community, even if you don't have a community, because the more you do something, the more uh, people are going to understand what it is. It's kind of like building anticipation over time. So if I want to launch a product three months down the road, I'm not going to talk about it the day before it's launched. Sure. Because no one has no idea what that one is. But if I start three months ahead of time, I'm like, hey, in three months I'm going to do this. And I say that every single day. Yeah. In three months, people are going to be like, oh, I get it. Like, I, I saw you build that right there, like two weeks ago in your story. And now it's here. Yeah, so yeah. That's the way I thought about it. And so I, I've just always been a fan of creating visually. I remember on Instagram, pop stories, like, I like their editor better than like Photoshop. One, because it's just quick and easy. Like, literally, just like it's so powerful once you learn how to use the layers and advanced techniques. Like, you wouldn't think of like Instagram stories as being a photo editing app, mm-hmm. but half of the stories that I create, I design like in Instagram as if it was Photoshop. Like, it takes me like 10, 15 minutes. Wow. And I don't have to open up Photoshop or be at a computer. Like, it, wow. half of my scribbles I just do right there in the Instagram editor app. I wondered if that was the case, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, it's like, it it just makes my life easier. Now, if I want to do something more complex, yeah, I put it over to Figma or or Procreate or the creative cloud too. But at the end of the day, um, I create and I create instantly and I create publicly and that is what gives me my shield. So if you have no one right now, to, to support you start creating it really um, to one person will be like hey that looks cool yeah and yeah. 
it's also not hard to ask. You can just go out and be like, hey, do you do, can you do X? Um, mm-hmm. can, you, can you feedback on this new project that I'm start? Phrases are great. Questions are great. Uh, randomly go out. Even ask the person you don't know that you like. It can be an idol. It can be a long-time friend that you haven't talked to in forever. It can be someone you talked to yesterday. Uh, so yeah, to sum that up, it's just simply create, build in public, ask. All that ties in together. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I, I think it's really, I think it's really um, inspiring for sure. Uh, and I hope it, I hope it's inspiring for somebody. Hmm. Let me let me think on this sentence. <laughs> I think that I think that I have interacted with so many people and so many versions of myself that that maybe put val- different value to different types of creating methods, right? So if it's in the art, like if it's in visual art, you know, concrete spatial visual art it's like you know oh oil painting is superior because a b and c and that comes from so many different cultural like ties oh it's better pigment oh it lasts longer oh it's what you know royalty used right Mm -hmm. and at the end of the day it's kind of bullshit like it it could be true in some ways and it's also kind of bullshit and i think that that kind of even gets translated into into digital spaces where like Oh, you have to use Photoshop, or you have to use Adobe Illustrator. You have to use this or that, and and I think I think it's very inspiring every time I interact with anybody who uses something that's free. You know, Instagram's right there, just like a pencil is fairly cheap. <laughs> it's right there in front of you, you know. But there are these digital tools. There, that's it, you know. Um, and so. I, I think every time I think I think of that as like a, a, a beacon, you know, a beacon in the distance. It's like for for young creators to remember that they don't have to you don't have to drop, you know, five hundred bucks or whatever it costs per month on some high tech mm-hmm. something. Um to make something good. Um I guess that that brings me to another another question. Um I know that you had briefly alluded to talking about or, or saying that you were um you were doing some like some education you're you're doing some work some new work i think with young yeah. young artists uh young young entrepreneurs young entrepreneurs entrepreneurs yeah I, um th- this has been a fun trajectory because uh i guess before i'll do a quick like path for 2020 and in terms of like my gigs and my jobs mm-hmm. so prior to COVID I was working in virtual reality COVID hit got laid off and that really enabled me to just reset and figure out what was next that's how Visionary Pass was born uh, that's how the Creators Conference was born that's how Justin that chat was born mm-hmm. and uh, since then I've also just been actively figuring out like, do I want to get a job do I want to work part time um, do I want to raise money for my projects and running as a company just been really fun to like crowdfund and to uh, sell right now and uh, over the course of these months I've been like actively interviewing and I interviewed for a uh, youth business coach position uh, I'd say like a month or two ago um, in addition to many other roles that I've interviewed for um, and I meet and still to this day Interviewing another piece of advice at my first company that I talked a lot about at the was to consistently like put yourself out there and also like for someone um, I think at like my first job pretty much told me to always be interviewed like they would all also encourage me to go on. I feel like it's not like that with every every company because I've worked for companies where it's like if you're interviewing it's kind of awkward. Mm. And weird, like you wouldn't want your manager to know, or you wouldn't want to tell anyone. But like, even when I've had full time jobs, it's like I'm always still prepping. How do I pitch myself? How do I share my story? How do I do? All... But long story short, um, I managed to to interview, and I landed this uh, job uh, where I'm teaching social entrepreneurship to a bunch of incredible uh, youth entrepreneurs that are in middle and high school, and. Uh, 
Um, it's a 12 week incub incubator program where they each week are learning and do business tasks and learning about entrepreneurship and how do they create a business that focuses on a social or environmental issue that they can solve. And um, my main role is uh, to, to be the tech and events coordinator, taking a lot of the work that I did over the summer actually with uh, the Creators Fund, just running a virtual for these youth Hmm. entrepreneurs to launch their businesses because typically before COVID it would have been done in person. Right, right. But now it's like, oh, we can't do this in person. Hey, Justin, you just ran in person or you just ran an online event. Come help us run an online event. Wow. I'm like, sure, this sounds perfect. Yeah, cool. <laughs> so that's that's how that transition all happened. That's really and, cool. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's been fun. And, like, I have not worked with high school and youth students since... 2015, mm. um, and actually worked with like elementary school students then. So in like four years, I've been working with adults, and now transitioning back into like the uh, youth phase has been you know, really refreshing because long term would love to see a complete reset on our education system in a way we I think COVID's already done that in a way, but like instead of putting a whole band aid on Zoom remote yeah. learning, like, actually invest resources and pedagogy into remote learning rather than oh we have to do, do remote learning so now we're forced to do it and we'll let you do it sure yeah but uh, so yeah that's a, a little bit about you know, what i've been doing uh, with the teaching of, of youth entrepreneurs i think what's really powerful about that is you know i think i just realized this for the first time the kids that are experiencing this on like that are receiving this either bad examples of a revised system or working with you and getting to see something beautiful, getting to see the interesting complex revised versions of what education could look like. They're going to be in positions of power <laughs> in positions of, you know, independent creators status in a couple of years. And they'll be leading those conversations as well. So that's really fascinating to think about. You know, we oops, we often think about like, I, I think we often think in terms of like when that person is able to legislate something in twenty five years. But no, that's not really. It's not how that works. It's like they'll have an influence on this quick turnaround five ten years. They'll be having those conversations with you. Yeah, and that's magic. One that makes it even more special. They can have those conversations now right. if they want. Right. If they're prepped for it. And I, I think about how for years, this whole transition of, of parents actually understanding work from home culture. I'm going to call it work from home culture because sure. the, the tech industry has been doing it for a long time where you, you, know, you wake up and you go on Zoom. And to see everyone else realize that, like, oh, this is what it's like. Like, to, if I look at the typical Zoom schedule of a high school student, it's most likely not going to be any different than when they start writing that legislation or when they start working on their art or when they start doing cool, untitled podcasts and video recordings. Sure. Like, it's literally the same thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, right. <laughs> so I, the, the fact that one's going to have like a great experience of like, oh, I love waking up and getting on my Zoom meeting and learning how to launch a business compared to, oh, I don't want to go to entrepreneurship class B because the teacher is 60 and actually never launched a business, forced to talk this over a lecture platform <laughs> doesn't make any sense because it's not in person. Like, those yeah. are two different like, scenarios. I don't even go off on a tangent on that because I'm, you know, this has nothing to do with even what we're talking about, but it reminds me of how kids are consuming media today, mm -hmm. like YouTube Kids, mm -hmm. YouTube, or Disney Plus. Like, you remember when we were kids and we just turned on the TV and we watched, like, what was on, and then, like, we got older and we are like, hey, you remember, like, watching SpongeBob? Like, that was cool, right? Yeah. So when that grows up on YouTube TV or, or Disney Plus, mm -hmm. you know, when one family grows up on one platform and another grows up on another, they're never going to be able to, like, communicate mm. about hey i enjoyed episode one of this series 
oh, I didn't have that TV subscription service. I have no idea what you're talking about. Oh, that's so interesting. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a really good point. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And, and how, you know, this generation of youth will grow up with have complete different realities in a way because of remote learning and technology. Yeah, yeah. That's that's a really fascinating point. I feel like I'm going to need to think about that for a while and get back to you, because <laughs> it it that really that births a whole conversation. It it sort of turns any conversation that about exclusive consumption or like exclusive media on its head, right? Like you have to give everybody access to these things on a cultural level. Of course you do, and if we were talking about public media, public radio, it would be, it's an easy conversation, right? You go, oh, of course news needs to be public, you know, for adults to consume so that they can be informed voters. But like, it kind of is the same thing for kids. It really is kind of the same thing. You need to know, you need to have common, you know, you need to have shared experience for sure, right? Like, yes, this, this, it is how you connect. This all this formed all of us, you know. Oh, that's so fascinating. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I forget the tangent of what created. I think we're talking about like two different Zoom mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. experiences or, or two different learning experiences. Yeah, I, I felt the same way about the way we consume and the way we're teaching. They're, they're similar. Yeah, and it's interesting because. Oh, that's something to, that's something to think about like cultivating cu- cultivating that in in terms of what can then be shared right um because because now right now any kids going through it their shared experiences will be hey remember t- 10 years ago when we all had zoom calls and our teachers didn't know what the fuck they were doing <laughs> that's what it's gonna be you know but like <laughs> That's so interesting. I'm just, I'm stuck on it now. Um, I think, I think it's really fascinating to think about, like, like I, I think we might have even talked about this before, but, but Brandon and I both homeschooled and, and my homeschooling was a lot of independent learning. And so when you talk about what you're talking about and even made the connection to like what our lives look like now as adults in these spaces, <laughs> which is like, you know, very self-determined like that. That is what my life looked like. And I'm, I'm really grateful for that. Um, it was, it was a, a huge like privilege to be able to do that. And it was, it was a burden and, and, a, and a privilege, but, um, but it's fascinating to think about that. Like there, there's, there's almost an opportunity. Homeschooled kids and homeschooled parents, homeschooled educators have like often been pushed aside in terms of like public school conversations. They're really like, I mean, we're aside from the fact that they're taxpayers, like that's always, it's always a weird thing. Like you pay taxes for the public school, but then you don't get access to things like that. Very wild system. Um, they're always, they're also not really included in discussions on how, education should work when really like you're doing one-on-one education you're learning how education should work like from the ground up and so it's funny to see it's it's interesting to see um sort of a realize a realization of what homeschooling looks like on a grand scale with with some of what you're talking about Mm -hmm. yeah Um, i train being homeschooled when i when I was young, it's funny because my uh, mom was sort in public education for over 25 years, and uh, I remember like randomly throwing out the idea when I was in middle school, like, "Hey, homeschool me!" And she looks at me like, "What?" <laughs> <laughs> um, especially thinking, I've always wondered how. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I've had friends that have done like, um, not like you could. Um, people that do homeschool and are like doing it, but parents aren't involved. And then you've got homeschool where like parents are involved. Right. And I think a lot of people are like parents and like, oh, homeschool, I'm not gonna have a life. Sure. Uh, kind of a thing. But the biggest reason I went homeschool and was so 
I could have the autonomy to do the fashion projects that I enjoy. Yeah. But I never had any of that. Yeah. That's how it's so that's what I've heard from everybody, you know, and it, and it breaks my heart. It's, it's, it's why the first thing that I ever, this is my tangent now, I guess. Um, I think I was 16 when I started tutoring. Um, I started doing private tutoring uh, for other home, other homeschooled kids or other kids of, of other, you know, public school. Um, and that was like my first, that was probably my first venture into, into, I guess, community leadership on a very small scale, you know, it was like knowing that I had something that I could help bring to somebody. And it was, it was, um, it was mentorship. It was like an awareness of how to, um, join yourself to education in a way that doesn't suck, <laughs> you know, how to find passion in, in the work. Um, that's actually how I met Brandon. I don't know if you knew that. Uh, I think a lot of people don't know that. Um, but, uh, <laughs> Yeah, but uh Yeah, I just it breaks my heart. I wish that I wish that more people uh, of my age, like like you, could have gotten that and and I'm hopeful that kids now maybe will get a little bit of that. I uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I definitely think with Yeah, I from what the experience is I'm hearing even those that are doing Zoom, some days now they do have a bit more autonomy because you're not going to send a Zoom call for eight hours a day right. or a whole 90 minute class. You may have a two class or a three class. It's something that long break for a long time, which feels like kind of the dream in a way. It's like, oh, I do my morning classes and I have all evening and afternoon and maybe even you know, a large part of that afternoon to do whatever. But it still could be more personalized. It still could be more engaging my I'm hearing a lot of parents and teachers now have to teach with cameras off hmm. and hearing that sounds like torture I could, could you imagine walking into a zoom meeting that's professional and just like bye um, I'm gonna turn my camera off and not talk yeah <laughs> you hear that like kids can do this like some school districts are comfortably okay with or I wouldn't say okay, but you know they're saying that they can't make their kids turn their camera off because of the situation. Mm -hmm. you know, possibly at home, it could be you know whatever any excuse or any like I feel like it should be our job as public educators and school districts to create a perfect kid to learn at home. Sure. And if it's not good enough to turn their camera on, then we need to be doing a better job but, uh, or providing them with everything they need. But like I cannot teach them. 20 person zoom and three faces on the screen yeah, that, yeah. yeah that sounds like torture <laughs> yeah no that you make a really good point uh yeah uh, and i agree with that it's just not something i've ever thought about that that it, it is the job of the education system to do to provide those services to provide um and that and that comes back to the to the the sort of solilo soliloquy of, of community, right? Like, it is the job of of that education system to provide a safe sanctuary space for a child to feel like they're willing and able to learn, which is exactly what community building in the arts is about. You know, whether we're all adults, and I'm not, you know, I'm not coming into a community space saying, hello, students, right? But like... But, and yet, every day that I enter into my community spaces that I lead, I'm kind of doing that, right? I'm kind of entering into, into my spaces and thinking, it is my responsibility to provide a shield for these people, to, to create an environment for them to feel like they can uh, maybe not learn on a, on a sort of intake level, but, but learn emotionally or grow emotionally, you know, provide a space for somebody to heal or grow. Um, and it really is exactly the same conversation, I guess, in terms of the education system. Yeah, I like how, how you mentioned to heal and to grow the type like, directly into providing really plus link everything we just talked about, our shield, right. our vulnerability, um, and community, those, those things. And if you don't have those resources um, that, that get you that baseline foundation. 
yeah, you've, you've given me a lot to think about tonight. <laughs> I feel like um, that, that's what these conversations, uh, that's what I'm missing in these conversations, you know, um, not getting the chance to have a friend over and, you know, just chill and talk until your voices are raw. Um, you just get to see a slightly different perspective on something that you, you might think about a lot. But yeah, I, I love it. And I love the whole theme and the title of like the fact that it is untitled and it's just like, you know, just hit record and go. And, and I hope that with, you know, online communication, it can become more vulnerable and more real feeling. Mm. Yeah. Um, until in person talking is a thing again. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess like being a, a bit vulnerable here is I have people that ask me like what do you do for fun or like what do you do for hobbies or um, or you know when you hang out with your friends and with COVID and even before COVID you know just working and tech and figuring out you know, how do you advance friends were never like a, or social life was never a core component of my life and, like I would consider myself a workaholic like mm. I literally I wake up and if I feel comfortable enough to get out of bed, I will get out and work. Mm. Otherwise, I will sleep. <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, but it, I, I want to put an emphasis on the real in real life part because I don't think I've had a real like in life component to going out with friends. Like I'd say, ninety percent of my time is like connecting with people on the internet. Mm. Um, and especially during COVID, I even say it's probably increased to like 99 because that 10% of connections and friends before COVID would be like going to an event. And those would be people like I either met that day or people that I met at an event a year ago, or two years ago. Like the social layer of my life was like literally going to not working parties, you know. Hmm. Now that COVID has removed that, it's been even harder. So it's always interesting when you tie that whole friendship component and ability to communicate. Um, so when it's just work, like typically not where humans are related to work. So it's like, oh, I actually want to go out and not talk about work. Like, sure. Who do you do that with? Or how do you do that when 90% of your work is what you do for a hobby? <laughs> exactly. Right. Well, and that's the big point, right? I think that I feel that way too. And that's like, that comes back to the way that I, I phrased it earlier, which is like, um, I feel, I feel so radicalized <laughs> and that, that even just includes every part of me. I feel, I feel the same way. I, it's like, I don't know, I don't know what I am if I'm not these, these few components anymore. Um, and that's okay. Like, I don't see that as a bad thing. I see that as, I almost see that this is my, like my truest form, well, maybe the form that I always wanted to achieve, but didn't have the ability to until now which yeah. is sort of like an opportunistic opportunistic kind of way of talking about it. Um, but I guess I, I want to, I, I actually had as my last question for you, um, and I think it ties in so perfectly. Uh, I, I want to I know how you interact with, with rest and the feeling of rest. And I guess I want to preface it by saying, you know, talking about the, the last thing we were talking about, you know, com coming up with our own stuff, with your own schedule and, ma and being your own boss and creating another generation of that kind of person, right? Like when I homeschooled, one of the big aha moments for me was realizing that I could do work and then I could take like 15 minute breaks and like play guitar or something that really excited my brain. But when I took those breaks, I always told myself that the break had to be something productive. It had to be something that was for me, but I was still moving forward in the world. And I'm 27, and it's taken me 27 re years to realize that, like, I don't have to be productive every second, you know? In fact, for a couple of years, it took me time being, like, not being productive is productive because rest can be productive. That's how we heal. I needed to go through that whole process for myself for many years. And, and now I'm really starting to find like the self care enough to just be like, it's okay to rest. <laughs> That's necessary. Just chill, you know? And so I'm wondering how you interact with that, you know? Yeah. 
I'd say my favorite parts of life are just like doing absolutely nothing. Um, and when you, it's not often that I get to do nothing, um, mm. but it just depends on the state of life. I, not early that day, I'd say most of my life dictates um, what I'm doing that day. If I have to be up early, typically it's like a phone call or it's a, you know, a scheduled meeting, then I'm like up early. Or if a project is due, like I love waking up at 6 a.m. and like reviewing it and then you know, going in. Um, but it just really depends on what is on the day. Hmm. Because I'm also a natural like night owl. Uh, I think it comes from just growing up and you know, playing games late at night or um, having sleepovers. And when you just work on projects, or also just like when I got a computer at a really young age, like just being able to be on the computer and um, think about like, if I want to get something done, typically school's during the day, I've got two hours of after school, I've got homework, and then I have no time with my life. So I think I just will have my time at night and I'll be home on the computer. Uh, I think that habit has like stuck with my professional life because when I want to work on a project, if I get really excited about it, I have a bad habit of not sleeping and the next thing you know it's 5 a.m. and I'm like, hmm. and um, you know, it just happens. And the only thing that really gets me in the bed is if I have to wake up at 9 a.m. the next morning or if I have to, and it's, I wouldn't say I would recommend that for people, but I would say I'm a jack of all trades or a hybrid between like being an early bird and a night owl mm-hmm, mm-hmm. because I can wake up if I need to. Uh, all throughout COVID, I've not had a consistent sleep schedule. I don't, it's really been dictated about like, if I've got a meeting in the morning, let me make sure I'm in bed by 12. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, otherwise, I will stick and just work on stuff every hour, every second. Um, oftentimes I have a lot of my time like pulled away with, you know, either direct messages or, um, you know, scheduled events for fun. I guess would be another thing. So yeah, sure. Well, and UX. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really confused when it comes to time in today's world. Yeah. Because of COVID. Yeah, that's understandable. Yeah. I, I, do you do you find that that even with that being the case, do you, do you feel do you feel that you provide yourself the? I, I think what I like about the term rest is that it's it's up to interpretation, you know. Uh, and I think I've only I've only recently started to learn that that mm-hmm. you know I used to I used to translate rest to mean a very particular thing, and I think anymore I don't. And and so I guess my question would be that even with an with an um, inconsistent schedule, like sleep schedule or rest schedule, do you find that you're giving yourself the thing that feels restful to you in, in a way that that gives you the healing that you need? Yeah. Um, ever since COVID hit, and I've had like complete autonomy over the things that I've done. Yes, it's been like great that I can decide like oh I feel like crap today I'm not going to get out of bed yeah. or, oh I want to get out and design and decision or, or oh, I want to go grab materials for this like it feels great to do that and I love the moments when your body makes you rest yeah. um, I think that happens to me a lot where it's like if I wake up really early and I work from let's say you know, 6 a.m. to nine uh you know i can start feeling it right around seven eight eight like oh this is not going to be at 12 12 a.m 5 a.m night like the body won't just make me go to bed uh i think that's even more crucial to just be able to dictate and listen to when you feel like you need rest um i love taking like mini breaks and mini sleep sessions but the bad thing about that for me is majority of my like naps turn into like they they evolve beyond naps. They go from like, oh, I'm gonna lay down for 20 minutes. Next thing you know, it's like nine o'clock. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I try not to do those, but yeah, it feels great to to relax. Um, I use the the Pomodoro technique all the time, where I'll 25 minute take a five minute break and then go yeah work for another session. Music has helped out a ton. 
uh, to fill. I've got this like browser plugin where you just press the button and the music just starts playing. Wow, that's cool. And like, that's the one thing that kind of gets me going. <laughs> Is it just randomized music? Um, Is it like a playlist? Um, I will send. It's actually it, it's called Opera GX. It's just built into the browser. And it's like their uh, hmm. their music. I don't even know how to describe it. It's their thing. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You'll have to send that to me. I'll, nice. I'll link it. <laughs> that's cool. Well, that's that's cool. I I I'm glad to hear that. I'm 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 always happy to hear uh, as I as I discover my journey with rest. <laughs> I'm always happy to hear other people's journeys and and to hear that that it's healthy. You know that it's self determined and um you know that it's that it's healthy. That's that's what matters that, that you're that we're cultivating ourselves because we have a lot we have a lot left to do you know I guess that's the that's the roundup is is you know we are we're pretty we're pretty precious um, resources in in this moment and any moment really of, of course but but we're pretty precious right now so um, so yeah I hope that I hope that you're able to continue give your, giving yourself necessary rest and care um, and I guess I guess I will I will just wrap up um, by asking if there's anything that you want to plug or talk about or anything you want to ask before we head out. Yeah, likewise, I um, big big fan of you know feeling rested and, and staying free. Um, I would love to plug. I want to connect and actually have conversations with everyone. So come say hi justin.chat send me a message cool leave a comment cool. um and yeah let's have a, a genuine conversation <laughs> yeah i'm happy to link that as well we'll do we'll do a whole host of of links at the bottom of this <laughs> awesome cool yeah i think um cool. yeah I think that's it. I, I, I was going to say that I, I have things to plug and I think the only thing I have to plug is, um, probably giving yourself rest. I could say a lot of things, you know, we have Patreons and this YouTube and Justin has a Patreon and a, and an art, an art website. You can go purchase art from him and, and resources and classes and things. And, and there's all kinds of things I could talk about, but probably the most important thing right now is that anybody who who is watching this um, gives themselves some rest for a little while, because, like I said, we're we're all fairly we're all very precious resources right now, and uh, we have a lot of work to do, and a lot of community to be building um, in the days ahead. So, yeah, I think I think we uh, we'll say we'll say goodbye. We'll say goodbye. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you for thank you for chatting with yeah, me. Nice. It is it is always an honor to get to speak to you and to to hear you talk about things, and to to see things in a, in a new uh, like visionary light. That's that's always yeah. wonderful. I appreciate the kind words. Cool. Well, I'll talk to you soon, and and uh, and you, our our people who are watching this will be able to follow you. The moment that I hit stop. <laughs> That's a weird way of ending this. Bye.